salutations. My name is Butch Lazar Chack. I'm from the Internet Program at the Library of Congress. And I want to thank you all for sticking around. I'm actually very pleasantly surprised at the number of you who are still here. And I think that speaks to the quality of, uh, of, the, of our panelists here, who I will, I'll introduce in just a second. Um, I want to thank all of you for attending uh, Digital Preservation 2013. You know, when we were putting together the program, you know, we, we put things on there that, that we were interested in, in hearing about. And sometimes I wonder if, if, it's, if, if it's apparent when you see each presentation, you know, that people are like, well, what, what is that person on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the bill? And hopefully you'll see as what, you know, Frank Zappa called conceptual continuity clues, you know, running through the, the thread that runs through all the presentations during about Digital Preservation 2013 meeting. And you know, you, you, you know, if you look closely, you see these things, you know, collaboration, or what are some other examples of collaboration that are successful? Things that we as, a, as the NDSA community can learn from, uh, things that we can draw from, uh, groups that we can engage with. You know, the idea that there's technology out there that we can all leverage for our own, you know, the technology alone isn't the answer, but there are technologies out there that we can learn from and utilize to do the kind of work that we need to do. And certainly, because you know, because of the level that all of you are working at, the level that we're dealing with at the Library of Congress, we're always thinking about innovative ways to, to move the ball forward. And with, through all the presentations, the idea is to introduce ideas that will make us think about the work that we do in new and different ways and um, uh, you know, uh, inspire us to, to, to try new things, both as a group and individually in our own organizations. And I think that's what our panel, our final panel this afternoon really speaks to. Um, Aaron, uh, we have three folks up here. Aaron is, is from the museum community, but the other folks are not. And that was sort of by design, I think. And that we want to bring in perspectives from outside the Library Archives Museum community, uh, state government, local history uh, museums, etc., to try and infuse the, their ideas into our community, because certainly there's, there's plenty we can learn from for those outside of us outside of these walls. So each of, each of them are going to talk to uh, some innovative aspects of the work that they do, and I think you'll find it very enlightening for the work that you do. So let me introduce each of our panelists. So first off, we have Amy Robinson. She's the creative director of iWire, a game to map the brain being developed at the Computational Neuroscience Lab at MIT. iWire is a community of 60,000 gamers. I'm sure these numbers have increased since this was written. 60,000 gamers from 130 countries who map the 3D structure of neurons and discover neural connections. In the middle, we have Rodrigo Davis. He's a research assistant at MIT's Center for Civic, uh, Center for Civic Media. He's an MS student in the Comparative Media Studies program there. And this summer, he's in San Francisco as a Summer Innovation Fellow at the Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation. And finally, down at the end, we have Aaron Strop cope He's a senior engineer in digital and emerging media at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. Prior to this, he's held positions as a senior engineer at Flickr and also a design technologist. One of my favorite design firms, Steam and Design. So the way it's going to work is each of them will give you know, roughly 20 minutes or so presentation. We won't take questions after each one. We'll just wait till the end and take questions from all. Because um, I think you'll find that there are overlaps between the different kinds of things that they're talking about. And then afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for, for questions. So first off, let's hear from Amy. Yet, one of the greatest unknowns is so close to home that it kind of is home. 
This is three pound organ that's right behind your eyes. You know, it, there are seven billion conscious human beings on this planet. And yet we can't even answer really fundamental questions like how do we learn and what causes mental disorders like autism and schizophrenia. Um, this incredible organ, you know, is made up of about 85 billion neurons. Uh, there, are, there are roughly as many synapses, which are connections between neurons, in your head as there are stars in the universe. Now, just let that sink in, because that kind of gives you a sense of the complexity of the amazing organ that makes you who you are. And it also kind of gives you a sense of why we don't know so much about it. Uh, uh, neurons have really only been known to be discrete entities for about 150 years, uh, and we're heavily reliant on new technologies to even be able to see this thing, um, much less be able to understand it. Uh, and one of the things that we look closely at at, at our lab, Sebastian's lab, uh, is connectomics. So we're very interested in understanding how neurons connect together to form information processing networks in the brain. Uh, and one of the big, this field is relatively new in neuroscience because technology has only recently in the past couple decades even really existed so that we can see it. So what you see here is a diffusion tensor image which basically tracks the movement of water in the brain. Uh, it's from the Human Connectome Project and it's beautiful. They have a wonderful gallery of, of images like this. Um, and what you see is deep connectivity, uh, super highways if you will, between distinct regions of the brain. And these maps are very similar from one individual to the next. Quite like your, your, your genetic code, we're all 99.9% similar. Uh, I don't know the actual ratio of how similar these are, but they're remarkably similar. Which kind of raises the question, how are you unique? You are. Everyone is. So what makes you different than everyone else if you have so much that's the same? And one of the theories is that you are your connectome. So you're defined by this constantly changing map of connectivity between the 85 billion neurons in your brain. So you know, what do you look like? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, Each line that you see in this image is millimeter resolution. And that's millions of cells. In order to see individual synapses, uh, like you see here, uh, this is a synapse that's been discovered by our gamers in iWire, you actually have to look much, much closer, 100,000 times closer, which is what you're seeing in this. So these are tiny little pieces of brain. Uh, and this is the state-of-the-art method for reconstructing uh, neurons in 3D and actually even be, being able to see them. So you take a little piece of brain, you stain it because cells are clear and if you don't stain them, you can't see them, uh, embed it in resin, and then you use almost like a a deli slicer, if you will. It, it, uses a, it uses a diamond knife, and it slices these pieces of brain 40 nanometers thin. And then those are all lined up on the strip, and we image each one of them with an electron microscope so that we can see micron scale resolution. And since this doesn't necessarily give you a great sense of, of scale, um, we pulled this from Scale of the Universe website, which is a really amazing website to check it out. So there's the scale of the human. Zooming in, zooming in, teapot, hummingbird, egg, you can see wavelengths of electromagnetic spectrum, duckweed, who knows how big duckweed is, <laughs> um, you know, width of silk, we've already passed the human hair way back there, chromosomes, E. coli, I think now there's an even larger virus than this, um, but this is the kind of scale that the synapses are in your brain. And so once we've imaged at this ultra high resolution, then we actually take these images uh, and stack them up into a 3D volume of tissue, and then you can scroll through them and like you see in this picture, color on the inside of, of cell uh, walls, uh, which are delineated as sort of by the gray line, and then you can painstakingly reconstruct a tiny piece of one neuron. Now, what you see between the green and the red cell is a synapse, and that's what we're really looking for. One of the problems with the, the lower resolution images is you can see groups of cells, but you can't see the individual cells, how they connect. So liken it to you know, seeing Earth from space versus street view. At night, Boston and Baghdad look the same, but they're very different. Um, and so we use this technique to reconstruct connections between different cells. Anyone have a guess as to how long it takes um, a lab that's MIT, collaboration with Harvard and Max Planck Institute, we have some of the best technology in the world for reconstructing cells. How long do you think it takes us to reconstruct one cell? Anyone? Three months. Three months, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
a week? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little over a week. It takes us 50 hours, five zero hours, to reconstruct one neuron. And there are 85 billion neurons in just one brain. So, in, and they sort of look like this. It's a great image. And this kind of highlights what is one of the biggest hurdles in, in our ability to understand ourselves, which is we can't analyze the data fast enough. You know, at 50 hours per cell, that's 85 billion neurons, if there was one researcher who worked 24-7, it would take him 48 million years to map one brain. What? That's, you know, weird that we, if we want to answer those questions, like how does learning happen, and what yeah. happens when I'm happy, what happens, what's going on in my brain as I'm standing up here talking to all of you guys, we've got to move faster. And so our lab is doing this by drawing inspiration from these guys. <laughs> Angry Birds, people spend three billion hours every week playing online games. What? Three billion hours? That's, that's almost unfathomable. But if, so, so we have sort of looked to this gaming community and thought, you know, what if we could harness a fraction of this time that people spend willingly, you know, shooting birds to try to recapture, <laughs> recapture their eggs from, from rogue pigs? <laughs> what if we could, you know, capture this, this time and build sort of an interface so that people would help us make neuroscientific discoveries. You know, build an online community around that. So that's what we've started to do with iWire, and it's kind of working. This is a little graphic that we use in the game. We, we kind of just put up a little nub of a cell, and as people play, they actually reconstruct missing branches of, of the cells. And over time, they reconstruct entire neural networks. So this is a, a little video demo of what it's like actually in iWire. So we have now 72,000 people from 130 countries who have joined since we launched just seven months ago. Um, in the short term, they're actually discovering missing pieces of neurons, they're reconstructing cells, uh, and they're helping us to understand how we perceive motion. So it may come as a surprise that we don't even know how many types of cells there are in our own heads. That surprised me when I found that out. We actually don't even know how many types of cells there are in the retina. So, you know, if we don't even know how many types of cells there are, we definitely don't know how they connect. And so our lab is really looking at a fundamental question, which is how do you perceive motion? You know, you see my hands moving up like this. Everyone does. And there are specific cells that, resp that respond to just one direction of motion. But how does that work? I mean, that's a very basic processing question. And it's been unknown because it takes so much time to reconstruct these cells. So gamers are reconstructing them. They're helping us understand how we see the world. And in the long term, the action of people in iWire is being used to create advanced software. So basically tools that will be made available for labs around the world uh, so that they can more rapidly reconstruct neural networks from image data. This will lead to you know, faster um, discoveries about the brain. Um, you know, players go cube by cube and they reconstruct entire cells. And it leads to some really beautiful, oh sorry, this slide I think used to be at the beginning of one of my presentations. <laughs> um, but it leads to some really beautiful images, which I just put a couple of them in here. But I think one of the reasons that I'm here talking with you guys today is that you know, we've, we've, we're crowdsourcing science. And it has an impact that's much greater than reconstructing neural networks, as important as that is. Um, for one, it's, it's changing our lab. So in a typical neuroscience lab, you have a bunch of neuroscience. Whereas in our lab, we have graphic designers, we have programmers, we have bloggers, we have you know, New York Times people coming in to interview us all the time. We have all these people who are very interested in brainstorming with us, and consequently it changes the way that we approach our problems. It expands our ability to communicate what we do, because researchers typically interact with other researchers. So in order to interact with the general public, it takes, it takes a shift in perspective, I think. Um, and I think one of the most important things about what we do is that it gives the general public a chance to participate. Um, it makes science a part of people's lives. You know, our, our top scoring player of all time is a 21-year-old college student, and she lives in Belgium, and she's a history major. And she's the best neuron mapper in the world. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing. Our top scoring daily, um, daily player is a 
16-year-old kid from Bulgaria. No, sorry, from Serbia. He's going to kill me if he sees this presentation. <laughs> sorry, Chris. <laughs> yeah, so we know all the players. We chat with them. Um, we host challenges. They, they want posters and t-shirts, and, and they make us think. So we have fun with this science. And I guess I'm telling you this to kind of just plant a seed of you know, how you can engage the general public in what you're doing. And especially when you're dealing with data, you're probably digitizing a bunch of data. And as you're preserving it, you might need to you know, create databases of these images that you're doing. Um, these are some ways that we've found that work. Um, and that take something that's a task that needs to you know, just have to pay armies of people to sit in. It was completely unscalable. We just made it fun. You know, and our players make us things. We didn't make this image. One of our players made it. Didn't make this image. Actually, a group, we did a Google Hangout with a group um, in Algeria, and they made us a promotional video that had this in it. It was in French, and I don't even know what it said in the video, but it was a great video. <laughs> um, they make us memes. I don't always pretend to be <laughs> But what I do is on iWire number. And I love that there are 70,000 people pretending to be scientists. You know, it's a good world. The internet can be used for good. Um, this is our most offensive meme. Definitely. This, <laughs> we didn't, I didn't make these. Our players made, <laughs> made these for us. But yeah, there's a lot of them. They make videos and all sorts of things. Um, one of the things that we found that, that works really well if you're trying to crowdsource uh, data analytics, you know, a, as you're making a game, you have to have competition. So we did, um, back in February, we did the iWire games. And it was a competition between social networks. So it was basically Facebook versus Reddit in a battle to the internet death. And it was, I mean, they, they were crazy. And it was so much fun for us. Like, uh, I don't know, we, so we had different teams, Facebook versus Reddit versus Twitter, and Google Plus is starting to make a showing uh, versus our veteran players. And we said, OK, you've got one week to discover as much neuron as you can. And the team that discovers the most will let you name the first cell that's ever been mapped by gamers. And Team Facebook won, and they named it IFLS after the Facebook page. I effing love science. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that's the, the first neuron that's ever been reconstructed by people who are not scientists has an F bomb in the title. <laughs> but you know, competition is an effective way to. <laughs> to get a less engagement in your uh, citizen science projects. Um, so I'm actually a little bit ahead of time. I tried to go really quickly. Um, but this is kind of my last slide is this. You know, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one they herald the most discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. <laughs> and, and I really like this because it, it, it gives you, it reminds you to kind of take your perspective and just step back and rethink the way you're looking at the world. That's what our interacting with everyone from you know middle schoolers to high school students to people all over the world people who barely speak English, retired people, accountants, bankers, forex traders, everybody who's playing this game, we spend a lot of time talking with them, hanging out with them at Google Hangouts. Um, and it's, it's made us kind of take ourselves a little bit less seriously. I mean, our lab has a Harlem Shake video. Yeah. So our players made us do it, so we did it. <laughs> um, um, but also that, that sense of taking yourself less seriously makes it so you don't judge what you're doing. Um, I think that's, it's really hard to not do that, especially as you become a professional and as you're doing projects that are really very important. Um, if you don't judge yourself, then you let yourself think more freely. You let yourself share more openly. Um, and so that's kind of, we end with that's funny because humor kind of seems to do, do really well for, for our gamers um, and just for our lab in general. But that's sort of a snapshot of iWire, and I hope that you guys will come online and play, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions uh, after this uh, about how you can build citizen science projects or citizen digital preservation games uh, to help you do whatever it is that you're doing um, and getting the world to help. So I guess that's all.